This is the case of a patient with complaints of floaters and a superior scotoma perceived for two days. He was 54 years old, had a 1 plus nuclear cataract, high myopia, and on the fundoscopy he had two inferior retinal tears at the same level posteriorized associated with a macular on retinal detachment. In the OCT images, the vitreous was still a derived, and so we decided to indicate the treatment with sclerobuckling and cryopexy for this patient. The surgery begins with a 360 degree peritomy with the isolation of the rectus muscles and with the placement of a chandelier light. Since the bricks were located in the inferior hemisphere, it was preferred to place the chandelier superior. The use of a chandelier light and a non-contact viewing system can greatly help in the evaluation of the retina periphery, and it makes the surgical steps of cryopexy faster and more effective when compared with binocular indirect ophthalmoscope. To avoid excessive movement of the chandelier and the risk of touching the lens, after cryopexy it was removed. Subsequently, the buckle was passed under the rectus muscles and to reduce the risk of vitreous prolapse, the sclerotomy was sutured. The anatomy of this patient's orbit did not allow drainage to be performed in the nasal quadrant. So, the surgeon makes a linear incision in the infratemporal quadrant in the location previously marked to be in the retinal terrace position to drain the subretinal fluid. The chosen site was inspected and the drainage close to the inferior rectus muscles was avoided due to the proximity of the vertical's vein. After dissection until the uveal tissue was visualized, cauterization and drainage were performed using the Vicrum needle. Note that when depressing the site with a cotton swab, a local small bleeding occurs in a moment. At this moment in the surgery, this bleeding did not draw attention and the surgeon continues the step suturing the buckle in each quadrant and to perform the desired indentation. The sclerotomy suture was removed and the chandelier was replaced to assess the effectiveness of drainage and periphery indentation of the buckle. However, it was observed the presence of a subretinal hemorrhage related to the drainage of the subretinal fluid. At this time, the surgery was converted to parsplenal vitrectomy with a 23 gauge system. The surgeon performs core vitrectomy, induces the PVD, removes the retinal brakes flaps, and tries to assess whether local aspiration can mobilize some of the subretinal blood. Then, he places a perfluorobubble bubble trying to push the subfovial hemorrhage to a region outside of macula, but the blood is already clotted and did not move. The other attempt to mobilize the clot was to increase the volume of the bolus retinal detachment inferiorly and make eye movements to swirl the fluid and try to wash away the bleeding, but that didn't work either. Note that the positions of the bricks were also more posterior to the indentation of the buckle. The surgeon then makes a difficult interoperative decision to perform peripheral endocauterization of the retina and programs a 180 degree retinectomy inferiorly using the posterior brakes as relaxing incisions. When performing retinectomy, it's always important to remove the anterior retinal flap to avoid postoperative neovascular complications, traction, and detachment of the ciliary body. Finally, to remove the submacular clot, the surgeon uses a bimanual technique. In his left hand, he uses a soft tip cannula with passive aspiration to hold and fold the inferior retina, while with his right hand, he very carefully aspirates the clot with the vitrector. Then, perfluor is injected again to flatten the retina, and the laser is performed inferiorly around the retinectomy area, and in the end, silicon oil was chosen as tamponade agent in this case. <laughs>